Hello, everyone, and welcome to the weekly market check in here with myself, your host, Greta Wall, and the leader of T3 Live's Inner Circle Virtual Trading Floor, David Prince. David, thanks for being uh, here with me today and doing this with us. How's your day going? Pretty good, actually. Okay. Considering uh, some of the trauma in the markets, we were well prepared and maybe played a little offense by a defense yesterday. So I have zero complaints. I've been hoping we'd get a pullback and <laughs> Yesterday had some gut feeling we might might get one. Okay. Well, the title of today uh, is How to Trade Biotech Stocks Live with David Prince. So let's first talk about uh, your focus on the biotech sector, and then we'll get into uh, what else you're doing in, to, or in this week. So let's just as a reminder for everyone that David came into 2024 bullish on the biotech sector. So I'll look at a tweet back from in December uh, 26th saying XBI plus 1.89%. Four weeks ago, I went overweight. It's been Nirvana, now up 40% since Halloween. Uh, his target was that 101 area that was hit on XBI last week. So uh, it was a great call, and you've gotten lots of credit for that call. Your latest play in the biotech space has been Viking Therapeutics. It's been a focus for you since last week after their secondary offering. You sent out this tweet last Thursday saying, if you think firms worry about syndicate bid, then you're laughing. The trading desks love to see a bunch of flippers become fearful, puke their stock lower, only to watch it stair step higher the rest of the day. And that play has worked out for you. Uh, you sent this out, I believe it was yesterday, yes, saying VKTX plus 17 from last week's lows after the deal. What an opportunity it was. So talk to me about what made you want to buy size in Viking Therapeutics uh, following that secondary. What were you seeing in the stock uh, that made you do it? Sure. So, you know, there, there's like a lifeline that as you get older, you begin to understand with biotech and it kind of guides you on how to trade them, meaning in preclinical phase one, phase two, phase three, how much capital do they have? Uh, do they have to raise money? And obviously, on, on BKTX is a well-known story on the street now, entering what's the hottest market in biotech and what a lot of people think is actually helping grow the economy or keeping the economy uh, growing. So um, sometimes these uh, deals become easier. And what I mean by that is BKTX isn't about to go up four or five hundred percent like it already has for so many people who are in at 20 or 30. But a lot of institutions don't care about phase one and two. They actually have no interest in taking that risk. Where they want to be involved is they want to do bigger size and be very confident in a 50 or 100% gain, given the set of data they have, and be really sized for it versus when it's still uh, kind of a pot shot and we don't really have any data to suggest the company is on track to having successful phase two, phase three, and a drug that actually gets to market. So when I looked at a deal like VKTX and understand that a lot of analysts out there called uh, phase two data flawless, and then you realize the deal was done at, you know, what was basically the equivalent of 150% from where the stock was recently, I thought, okay, this isn't 2009 anymore. These firms have zero, zero reason to just hold syndicate bid, right? These, these trading desks now, it's a whole different game. They can't just protect the stock for the sake of it. Their money is important. Them reporting to the government how much net capital they have is important. So that whole game about just putting a bid up there just to keep a deal, unneeded, doesn't happen. And I thought, wow. There are a lot of kind of old school players who haven't adjusted to that, where syndicate bid breaks and more than anything, a trading desk from Morgan Stanley or Goldman, they, they love that, right? You create some fear, you walk it down, you let funds that were really in it for short term. They weren't in it because they, they love the weight loss craze. They weren't in it because they think it's a best in breed weight loss play. They weren't in it because they think Pfizer is going to take it out. They were in it because the stock they think is going to give them a premium today and they're going to make five bucks. Those people then, once it's 85, 84, they're out. And then they get out, some other people get out and you get that snowball effect. And then if you really believe in what you own and you understand the story and you, like myself, you believe that it's not going to be a standalone company, it'll be taken out or be a much higher stock. I think of it as an opportunity. 
And then usually what happens is all the quick money, the fast money has just sold it, right? And created this cascade effect, which we saw, you know, we I think the stock traded 75s last week after the secondary and we bought it. And then the whole parts of the game is, do you really believe in your thesis? And if you do, once it's back to 85, you're not selling it. I mean, sure, you can trim, which I did, but you're actually holding some. So when it's 93 again, like it was this week, then you can sell some because, well, that's like a 20% move in a few days. Uh, I don't know if I said that cohesively. I hope I did, but that, that's how we played it. Basically, like the company, understand right now outside of oral data that everyone's waiting on, the likelihood that this company is successful or taken out is higher than it's ever been. So to me, that puts a huge bid underneath the stock. So every time it's weak, I'm, I'm an aggressive buyer. But knowing how far it's come, I also manage money for a living. When I have these insane 10, 15, 20% gains in a matter of days, like we've seen in VKTX, I trim a lot, which I did yesterday once it was over 90. Right. Uh, zooming out to the, uh, the broader biotech sector, XBI has been your pick for all of 2024 uh, on a an index to you know follow the sector. Of course, we hit that one on one target that you had set for yourself last week. What's the latest on your XBI trade? Uh, what have you been doing since that one on one target was hit last week? The latest is I don't know if it was last week with you, but at some point, either that day or the day after. Oh, no, I think it was afterwards. Um, when I told you, I think we're going to pull back the next four or five points should be lower, not higher. And um, mm -hmm. I guess I got lucky because I was dead right. And we went from about 103 high recent highs to 98, came closer to its most bullish moving average. Uh, and I thought, okay, this is, this is the hottest space right now outside of AI. Are buyers going to step in? I said, yeah. So even though, uh, yeah, we own it lower, I, I think it'll actually bounce pretty solid from this level short term. So why not trade it? So outside of my long-term stock, I went out and bought stock, 9850s. We went out and bought 100 calls. This is, I think we did this last week, like Thursday. Mm -hmm. And those calls went up. You know, I sold them too soon because I'm a bozo, but I sold them up 40, 50%. And they went up like well over 100% that day. Uh, XBI went right back to those recent highs, 103. I trimmed some stock from 98. And now I'm sitting with a position because which I'm sure we'll get to, I'm a little, I don't want to say I'm risk off, but I am price conscious and I am much less bullish short term as of yesterday. So mm -hmm. I remain with my core holding in XBI and think it right here is neither a buy or a sell, but very happy with what I own. And think when we maybe get through a rough period, we will get closer to 110 and make some new highs on the year. Mm -hmm. All right. We will talk about your more overall bearish sentiment in a little bit, but first, um, you have been active in NVIDIA, uh, I mean, all the time, uh, but you, you know, opened up a long position on the stock last week, and I believe you're still holding part of that position as of this morning, correct? Correct. Tiny. All right. So talk about uh, that position, what you saw on the trade, how you have navigated it, and where you see things going from here with NVIDIA. Sure. So we don't bore people. We might have gone through it last week, but I basically looked at the stock uh it had basically i said basically twice it had a uh what was the equivalent of about a six percent pullback from recent highs right we got to about 823 824 pull back to 770 or so and i looked at it and thought five days in a row making lower lows but very small lower lows this looks like a great entry uh, and I don't have any on the books, and I don't think that high will be it. So I got long. Um, we had a miraculous bounce, and not only did we get back above 800, we went right through that 820 some odd high. I think it was 823. It's not 823, it's 827. But whatever it is, on the way up, I trimmed, and then I looked at the chart, and clearly, like everyone else, saw that we were making another new high. And in simple English, when NVIDIA makes a new high. It very rarely doesn't have anything less than a 5%, 10% move. So rather than trim, I just sat with it. Um, and then yesterday, when things got insane, and at one point I was up 100 points from last week's entry, and AMD was up 
25 points from last week's entry. I was no longer in AMD, sadly, but still from that 185 breakout, which we aggressively bought, was up 25. SMCI included to the index, up 200. Bitcoin hitting highs, I thought. I'm willing to miss some upside. This is feeling a little bit spec speculative, and I'm, I'm going to hedge myself, buy some puts. I'm going to trim a lot of these winners, and <laughs> it's time to take a step back. Because I, I really think in the next, there, there were a bunch of levers that, well, I shouldn't say levers, there were a bunch of events that could cause a sell, like the, the Fed chairman speaking, like the NFP, like uh, our, our president speaking. So I just thought, you know what, there's a good time to take some profits and uh, let everyone else catch, catch the top. So mm -hmm. that's how I played it. I'm down to a trailer. And uh, this morning, uh, the only thing I've done is when we came into yesterday's lows, um, I told Inner Circle at 836, 837, this is about where it should bounce. And I did not add many people on the chat. I know went long and I thought mm, you might get a cute bounce into 848, 850 where we are now. So I know a lot of people on Inner Circle added to their longs today. I'm just sitting with my trailer. And that's mm. my NVIDIA trade. I, I think the top's in for a little bit. It's got to maybe mm. take a breath and, and breathe. Could it go to a 1,000? Mm. Easily, but it needs to breathe. You sent out uh, this tweet about, you know, that sentiment that things were getting a little insane for you, saying at 2 p.m. I reminded Inner Circle for those that missed NVIDIA, SMCI, and AMD to wipe it off as chasing can be as bad as missing a move. Thankfully, many have these names and more, but good traders are willing to miss some upside if they're late. The close exemplified uh, my thoughts. So what was it specifically in the action in yesterday's session that you were seeing that had you feeling that you should be maybe a little more hands off uh, toward the, the last few hours? Just too easy. You know, mm -hmm. it not like it was just too easy. If you can buy in the past week, XBI at 98 and a half, and then it goes to 103 the next day and VKTX at 76 77 and then two days later it's 93 and you can buy nvidia at 772 773 and then a few days later it's 876 and mm -hmm. amd can go up 25 points and bitcoin can just keep going up and not even get tired at 62 63 62 63,000, but continue to make new highs well if you're in this business for 30 years you know that doesn't have to mean we talk but it usually means that we never know when we're going to top, but locking in profits is not always a bad thing, or at least getting defensive and maybe buying some hedges isn't a bad thing. So I just thought, okay, th this is this is as good as time as any. It feels bubbly and insane, mm. and I can pretty much close my eyes, buy a dip on a quality name, and I'm going to make money. It's not supposed to be that easy. It's not mm. like rates are zero. It's not like our Fed chairman told us we're getting seven cuts. It's not like earnings were that good outside of AI. It's not like, oh, by the way, there aren't three leaders that are no longer leaders breaking down like Apple, like Google, like Tesla. So I looked at that climate and thought, it's time. It's time to take some problems. Looking at the overall market climate, um, like you said, like we haven't gotten any of those major what you would say think would be catalysts. The Fed chairman saying we're going to get a bunch of cuts. Uh, the economy, you know, breaking down to cause those cuts, things like that. What do you think it is in the market right now that has things just so frothy and toppy? Is it just people don't want to miss out, so they're just continuing to drive these stocks higher because they're buying them? Yeah, higher prices drive sentiment more than anything else. Uh, I am... You know, it's funny. I in the past couple of days, I told Inner Circle, the past couple of days, here's some weird things that happened. Um, two or three people that used to be out of the market that I respect and like, they're back in the market. For whatever reason, they had a rough couple of years. One of them happened to do with this core business. And I thought, hmm, now they're coming back. Uh, another lady seems like a very bright woman said, you know, in 22, she had lost a lot of money and swore off stocks. She's back. Um, a lot of people on Twitter are geniuses. All of a sudden, everyone just buy Bitcoin and it's going higher and it's going to 100,000. It just started to get a bit 
you, all the signals you get that say, hey, take a deep breath, just started to come. AI is awesome, right? But like AMD, someone, someone raised guidance by, by almost a billion dollars yesterday. Hey, it was a good call, right? They probably are literally seeing order flow like that. But the other side of their business, right, which has to do with PCs and such, it's really slow, so much so that they lowered overall guidance. So when a stock like that can ignore all that and just go higher, which by the way, is not necessarily wrong, but it's, you're, you're, everyone's buying ahead of time. I think what ended up happening is two things, just to get to the answer to your question. Higher prices drive sentiment. Yeah, and sentiment has just gotten hot. Then you have one of the most speculative assets, whether you like it or not, Bitcoin is speculative, right? I mean, it, it, something that's not speculative can't go from 16,000 in a short period of time to 69,000. So you have things like that driving sentiment. And then I would say since, th this is what I've noticed, since 2018, the market speeds up every single cycle. So being that there's a basic template the entire street knows, which is that rate hikes are over and rate cuts are coming. We just don't know when and how many. We are speeding along pricing in that cycle now and it is a little different. Like I hate when people say this time's different, but because of technology, because of funds, because of all the robots that trade, I think everyone just moves faster and prices things in and cycles and bear markets and bull markets and AI themed uh, type moves are all happening quicker than we used to see. That, that is my general thesis because I've seen it since, I've really noticed it since 2018. And people may say, but that that bear market lasted longer than an average bear market. But in essence, that bear market turned. And it, if you look back, was almost a bull market by the end of 22. And by the end of 22, early 23, there were clearly, there was a market that was pricing in rate cuts. And that's why we've gone up so much. I just think the market now does everything in a much more efficient, faster manner. Hopefully I made sense because I wanted to walk you through, but I... I've seen that since 2018. Yeah, sounds great. David, you mentioned AMD and Inner Circle had a great day with AMD calls last Thursday. Uh, two different trades. Uh, you went long the 185s for this Friday. Uh, so that was last Thursday. So it was a, a little a week out. And then you also uh, did the 185 lottos for the next day. Mm -hmm. uh, on Thursday, so the Friday lottos. What were you seeing in AMD last Thursday that said these calls are going to be great? And sure. then uh, they were definitely flyers. Like uh, I, I feel like you know beyond what you might have expected. Uh, so what was your signal that it was time to, to play with these calls? I'm a really fancy chartist, right? <laughs> All right. So you see that? Mm -hmm. Okay, cool. So that's about a month's worth of trading, right? We'd go like to maybe 170 and back up to 180. Everyone thought a breakout would happen, then lower. Then during that period of time, here's what the comps did, like SMCI and uh, uh, NVIDIA. This is what they did. Just went higher and higher and higher. And during that period of time, AMD, for good reason, because it didn't raise guidance the same in terms of overall earnings, just based and just tried to. So if you think about it, I because I'm not a chartist, I like to think of things in a kind of more logical manner. What that enabled uh, the stock to do is weed out all the sellers. So anyone who wasn't loyal to the stock, wasn't long term, probably said, you know what, I'd rather own NVIDIA. Like it makes a new high every day. In AMD, maybe it's expensive, whatever it is, it just can't go. I've learned through fighting stocks that are expensive and being dumb that just because something's expensive doesn't mean it can't break out. So I looked at the chart and said, I actually said to Rick and Kara, I'm like, this is nuts. This has maybe the best chart there is in the market. And it wasn't at new highs yet. It was 182, 183, but I could just see the relative strength. I said, if this breaks out after basing for a month, is, is it going up like $2? No, this thing, you know, if it makes a new high, which meant it had to get right above 184, 90, 92, this could be 195 the same day, let alone 200, which would be the natural target. And um, I said, you know, 
I'm not the trader who I, I don't believe if everyone's looking at the same thing, right? And waits for a breakout to buy something, you're taking a lot of the upside away and you're increasing your risk. So the way I like to play those is I put on a 30, 40% position because I usually believe in my gut. My gut was looking at the climate, what NVIDIA was doing and SMCI is doing and the relative strength, this should work. So I bought stock and both calls. And then as it broke 185, I bought more. And uh, then I obviously uh, cashed it. And uh, by the time those lottos went up like eight, 900 were up, even more. Uh, a wonderful kid on the chat, Spencer, I think, sold them at 16. College kid, great guy, is kid I mentor. He sold them at 16 from a dollar. <laughs> I sold them below. I sold them like nine or 10, but I held my calls for the following week because I'm a bit more conservative. Um, so I was like, all right, I have a week on those. And it, and it was an unbelievable trade. And even the other calls went up several hundred percent. And uh, at about 200, I said, enough's enough. This has been an amazing trade. I'll let someone else catch the top because versus an NVIDIA, which is really less about just being a breakout. It's a cheap stock versus its earnings, whether you like it or not. Uh, AMD was fun, but now I'm going to get out. So uh, that's how we played AMD. Uh, the latest news on AMD is that uh, regulators are not going to let them just sell their reformatted chips in China. They're going to have to apply uh, for, uh, they have to appeal the decision and apply for like a permit. I don't, I don't remember what the exact wording is, but you know, U.S. regulators have put restrictions on what these AI companies are able to sell to China. NVIDIA was impacted by this, but says they've reformatted theirs to be able to sell them. AMD thought they had, but regulators said no. Uh, how do you see this impacting the stock in the near Zero. Term? So it was really a buy opportunity. I told people most likely it'll be a buy opportunity. I, I focused a little bit more on a few other things this morning. But what was cool about AMD, we already kind of were told how much it'll impact it which was mm. kind of zero because nvidia just went through this and since it first went through it it's gone up well like 60 or 70 percent since it first encountered the china restrictions maybe even 80 percent so the point is we are in the point of the ai uh business or theme that everything is so early and demand is so great that having some issues with china means nothing now there will be a point where it actually becomes an issue right the way maybe it is for apple right now with china or tesla but right now in the the graph of a of ai and this this powerful kind of you know world that's taken over the, the order flow the business is so strong the 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 meta orders and the governments out there ordering like china doesn't make any difference which is why the stock you know rebounded right away um, but what's cool is I love when you get a shot to see how it'll play out ahead of time. So this morning I was like, I was focused on other stuff. So I said, AMD, probably 200 viable, 198, 195. But um, frankly, I, I should have just focused even more on it because they bought it right away. I think, I think like right off the open, it was only down a dollar. The rest of the market eventually tanked and we went lower. But uh, yeah, I mean, it's, it's still higher now than where it opened. So long story short, we already found out from NVIDIA right now, it doesn't mean much. Maybe one day having issues with China will, as I said, it does to other companies. Hmm. All right. Uh, big news in this space is, of course, that the SM is that SMCI is going to join the S&P 500. That will happen at the Open on March 18th. SMCI and Decker's Outdoor will be replacing Whirlpool and Zion Bancor. SMCI is coming into the S&P 500 with a as of today, plus $68 billion market cap. Of course, that could change ahead of time, could get even bigger. Definitely, though, uh, not really fitting in the small cap space anymore at this point. Uh, what does this mean for the broader market environment with this rebalancing happening and the S&P getting more exposure uh, to this AI semiconductor? That, that, that's the space? part. To me, it means like, let's say AI wasn't front and center thing that everyone was talking about which it already was now it's even more front and center even a more prevalent theme um so it 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 clearly ignited a whole nother buying spree we also saw positive news out of dell we also saw some ordering and what h 
HP was talking about in terms of uh, uh, AI, but it, it just ignited another buying frenzy, not just at SMCI, but told people like, this is, this is the market at the moment. This is what's holding the market up. Um, mm -hmm. Longer term, it probably hurts some people because there are going to be some people who chase these types of moves. Let's face it. Someone who bought these yesterday and just thought you can't lose it. It's going to keep going up. I mean, at one point today, they were down 150 points or the equivalent of what, uh, like seven, eight percent. So th there are going to be those chasers who get hurt because whenever a theme gets so hot that it's all anyone's talking about, including my mother, by the way, who brought it up to me this weekend. What a great call, and Nvidia. And that's awesome. And thank you. Um, but uh, and wanting to talk about AI that sometimes when let, let, I hate that whole thing about my cab driver ass or, um, you know, my doorman's talking about it and is it time to sell? But let's face it. There's a few too many people who are talking about AI that even if it is in its early stages of growth, that does not mean we can't have a five, 10 percent pullback on all these stocks. So I think it's time to prepare for that. I mentioned it yesterday, and obviously we've, we've seen some of that today. Hmm. SMCI only has uh, 50, just under 56 million shares outstanding. A lot of talk since this announcement uh, that they need to do a stock split, that there's not enough shares available uh, for them to be on the S&P 500. You, you agree? More than likely. I'd go with, I wrote on Twitter actually a couple days ago. I said, I think the likelihood is very strong they split the stock. Um, it, it still, in fact, trades like an e-liquid stock where you have, you have those 10 point swings in, in a couple ticks, uh, sometimes right at the open when I'm trading it, it'll be like a four point spread. So, I mean, ideally to encourage more retail, uh, not just institutional owners and institutions that can buy the stock without moving it around, you want to create more shares, have that, that four five point spread that gets insane, tighten up and usually a split helps that. So, uh, which I'm not a fan of. I love 50 and 100 point moves because if you're a good trader, that it offers a lot of opportunity. But yes, more than likely, it's it's going to split. All right. You have mentioned uh, that you're feeling a little bit more bearish about the overall market. So this is your tweet about those uh, yesterday. This tweet, your tweet about puts that you took, uh, saying QQQ. I took short term puts as a hedge given some of these insane moves. Uh, You've kind of touched on it already, but um, just what is it that you're seeing that says, I, I, mean, I don't know if this can continue right now. And obviously, I mean, looking at the market today, we're getting quite the pullback. Uh, so you definitely weren't wrong. Yeah. I mean, I, so we don't bore people. I just saw that I bought NVIDIA and in a few days it went up 100 and I bought VKTX in a few days I'm up 15 and uh, too many names to mention like that. And again, I want to say it, not because I'm the best out there because it got that dumb and that easy, right? I really believe it had almost nothing to do with me. I just am old enough and at least have half a brain enough to know where to focus. Um, and once it gets like that, it, it, it usually means that you can make some money on the short side. So I thought whether it's a hedge or whether it's just so inner circle can make some money even on a down day, because I'm a believer our job is to make money regardless of the uh, climate and to also mm -hmm. keep gains. So I thought, all right, we have a catalyst. We have the Fed speaking mm -hmm. and we have the president speaking. We have NFP. So if you're an institution and you're up gazillions in AMD, NVIDIA, Bitcoin, do you wait for all these events to take place or do you perhaps do a gut check and start to take profits? And my thought is, that these are not idiots and they don't wait till things go down, that they like to sell into strength. So why don't we buy some puts into strength, which is what we did yesterday. Yes, I trimmed some because the market kind of, I don't want to say tanked, but I had a hard reversal to the downside at the close and we were up a fair amount of money, but I, I took some profits and then held some today, which it became a real win. I think uh, some of these puts I was doing four, four, four on, on cues. They went from like, you know, from a dollar to like eight or nine. Uh, mm -hmm. By about five, I was out, but I, I shouldn't say a dollar. I think a low of a dollar 30, 40 yesterday, but huge, huge percentage move. So I thought, oh, it, it was also a hedge. And I actually, it made me have a, have a great day. So I, I think I'll take them off. I always caution people, if you are playing on the short side in the greatest bull market, perhaps we've seen in decades, maybe ever, in my opinion, um, 
do you try and stay short unless you have changed your opinion on the market and you just think it's topped out you'll probably take your gains when you're short so i have a general rule when i'm short this market whether it be puts or or i'm just short stock i don't o- overstay my welcome uh, mm-hmm. which sometimes hurts me I, I had a big short via puts in a snowflake this week and honestly i killed it it was a great trade and i took profits yesterday and today it's down another 10 and i'm like Oopsie Daisy should have held the trailer. But most of the time, greatest bull market in history, you're short something and you have puts, don't overstay your welcome. That's my basic theme. Hmm. Reminder for everyone who's with us live, if you have any questions for David, uh, submit them on uh, Twitter or if you're watching on YouTube or here on StreamYard with us because we're heading toward the end of our thing here. All right, so coming up this week, uh, of course, we get the Fed chair testimony Wednesday and Thursday. He'll be in the House Financial Services Committee tomorrow and then the Senate Banking Committee on Thursday. This is, of course, just his semi-annual monetary report, uh, policy report to Congress. So this is a scheduled thing. It's nothing that we weren't expecting, Uh, but he's gonna get some more maybe candid questions than he typically will answer during uh, a press conference after a meeting. So he's really in focus in the next two days. And then right on top of that, we're going to get the private jobs report tomorrow morning, jolts as well, the Fed beige book tomorrow afternoon, and then that official February jobs report, the NFP Friday morning. These are all things, of course, the Fed is really focused on uh, for that March 13th meeting coming up next week. So we get to hear from Powell this week, and then they have the meeting next week. What are your expectations for Powell's testimony? In the next two days. First thing, Jolt's report, uh, while we've become such a forward-looking market that has yeah. really been told directly by our Fed chairman, jobs, jobs, and jobs, I actually mm-hmm. want to see the market slow down. Um, the Jolt's report has been a market mover and is an important number. So pre-NFP, mm-hmm. people, that, that could be a market-moving event. Given the other stuff that's going on, is it going to overwhelm the market and move at 3%, 2% type of thing? Probably not, but don't be shocked to see a like 1% type of move either way on the JOLTS report because it does tell us about the jobs market. Um, mm-hmm. In terms of the Fed, I don't have an edge except to say that, you know, given recent data, he doesn't really have a reason to be overly dovish, right? It just doesn't seem mm-hmm. like he should be. Also, um, I'm not an economist, economist but I kind of always look at things simple, like the market's doing so well, Bitcoin's doing so well, if everyone's making so much money, and let me tell you, a lot of people are making a lot of money. I mean, some of the stories I hear are wild. And and here's what I mean by that. Like a lot of the bigger accounts, we're all doing well, right? And hedge funds are doing well. But I'm hearing the wild stories from the retail accounts, the guys who had a couple hundred grand that now have a million or two million. That's the type of stuff that maintains inflation because they're out there actually spending more than they normally would because they feel rich. So mm-hmm. as far as I'm concerned, the guy's much brighter than me. He probably sees all this and has all but zero reason to be overly dovish. And I'm not saying talks the market down aggressively, but definitely threads the needle and lets us know that we should not expect three rate cuts are guaranteed. And he has to see some data to suggest the economy is really slowing to begin the process that sure it's probably going to happen in the summer but that doesn't mean it happens again and again and again that maybe it's one or two times and not mm-hmm. three and not consecutive so those are the type of things i'm expecting but it's guesswork of course i'm i'm at least uh humble enough to say that <laughs> so based on the data i'm seeing uh yeah we, we see a slowdown and we see inflation coming off highs but is it over? Is the risk of it coming back on? Doesn't seem like it. So I think he has to thread the needle, which given where we are in the market, could be a bit of downside to the markets. Hmm. That's my next point. week's next week's Fed meeting comes with updated and updated summary of economic projections, the, the dot plot. Uh, the last dot plot we got in December was super dovish with those three rate cuts penciled in. Do you expect a change in that that uh those projections from the Fed when Ask it comes to next week. Ask me and Josh. <laughs> okay, we'll talk about it next Tuesday that, ahead of the meeting that, on Wednesday. I mean, yeah, yeah, that's, yeah. that's my answer. Let's talk after we get those numbers. Yeah, totally. Yeah, because the Fed is going to go into their um, blackout period after. <sighs> I think it's after Thank next you. Thursday. Thank you. <laughs> 
until the meeting next Wednesday. So they won't be allowed to speak because we've got a lot, a lot of Fed speakers. It's exhausting. Like, who speech? wants to yeah. hear them all day? It definitely yeah. And it's, it, you know, it depends who you listen to. One says three, one says two, one says none. So yeah. it all depends. All right. Uh, let's, you sent out this tweet yesterday saying trading is about the psyche, maintaining a level of confidence while never letting your ego take over. If you just copy others without understanding why you put a trade on, naturally you will lack confidence. I think this is an uh, interesting tweet from you because you are someone that a lot of people do follow for trading ideas and to follow your trades uh, yourself. So why did you think this was something you should tweet out and how do you navigate helping people understand why you put a trade on. I know you do so in the inner circle for your team there. Uh, so talk about how you navigate that in explaining so that other people can safely follow what you're doing in their yeah. own trading practice. I think VKTX is a great example last week. So if you buy something and you are cognizant that the secondary can break syndicate 85 where it was priced and actually if it does trade, you know, the stock came from at one point being a $10, $20 stock that it can easily trade under 80, but you understand what you're buying, right? You understand the possibilities ahead. You know about the oral, oral trial, excuse me. You know about Pfizer being like down on its luck and a disaster and really needed to spurn growth. If you understand all this stuff, right? and you haven't sized too big so you know your personality so you can look at a dip as an opportunity rather than an issue then you can really take advantage of things but you have to kind of know what you're doing and why you're doing it to have that confidence versus oh david bought vktx at 83 and 78 now it's 76. Now, if you don't have any context as to why or what the company does beyond just weight loss, there's a good chance at 76, you're like, uh, uh, and you just sell, right? Or if you understand why we're buying it and you really look at what's going on and you understand how powerful Lily's become that, you know, a lot of people say it's basically the other Mag 7 stock, then you probably look at it and say, hmm, I prepared for this and this is more than likely an opportunity uh, and something I should be taking advantage of. So I just think too many people, because of the market we're in now, are like, oh, Michael Saylor, MSTR, the world's, go you know, is going berserk and Bitcoin's going up forever, so I'll buy it. If you don't have those things, right? If you don't really get in tune with what can happen, what the risks are, then how do you have confidence? Because if you think about these things, like I always think when you buy something, you think about worst case scenario, what could potentially go wrong and therefore you size accordingly and when it happens it becomes more an actionable idea of anything not not a problem but an opportunity but we gain that confidence by thinking through a trade what is the upside what's the potential downside where do i want to be at half a position versus a full position that's how you have confidence because you plan these things out and actually think through it ahead of time and a lot of people I have a feeling <laughs> when you see markets go like that are not thinking that way any longer. So mm -hmm. I thought maybe a good time to mention it. Mm -hmm. All right, let's end things on a, a fun note here. Uh, move over Mag7, it's NASA time. Uh, you, this tweet was sent out yesterday. NASA, the Fantastic Four, NVIDIA, ARM, SMCI, AMD. You've made the point that uh, the chip makers are the market at this point, especially NVIDIA and SMCI. So for you, is NASA more representative of your market leaders than the Magnificent Seven, you know, Meta, Apple, Amazon, Yes, Google. but ARM's <laughs> expensive and, and probably doesn't stay here after the lockup. So it's a little bit tongue in cheek, but absolutely the semis and specifically the AI focus semis are, are, are the market. Um, underneath we have Apple breaking down, right? Well beneath, the 200 day at 23 relative strength at a level. In fact, I bought some today for a cash flow trade, made some, sold some, held some. But the point is, it hasn't been at 23 relative strength in a long time for well known issues, right? With how, how handsets are selling, specifically in China. But if Apple's breaking down, and the market could still go higher, by the way, right? And do just fine. And mm -hmm. Tesla is right back into that 180 level. 
um, or a bit below at one point. And Google, who tells you George Washington, you know, is, well, I, I don't want to say anything non-PC, but you get the idea. Google has some real issues. Um, it, when all these companies are breaking down that are leadership names in MAG and we can make new highs, yeah. Like, clearly, there are some new names that are leadership. And then you can throw in Eli Lilly and is BKTX no, in the market? No, but is the weight loss theme and the amount of money that's being spent there a powerful driver to the market? Absolutely. So uh, there's a change in leadership. Whether it lasts, we'll see. But in my 30 years, I remember Dell was once the most important company. And I remember when Cisco <laughs> was. And I remember when JDSU was. And I remember when Yahoo even was. And things change. Like the, the reason I think a lot of people forget Apple is Apple is we haven't seen many companies, first off, ever make that much money. That's a given, right? Like the amount of money they make, it's a, it's a virtual bank. But beyond that, we haven't seen companies be able to stay on top for that long. They usually have these broken periods and sometimes go by the wayside, like the way IBM has. Um, I know it's coming back now, but it's gone through two, two get decades of disaster. Um, so that's why Apple's so special. So the bottom line is right now, the market leadership is all through semis, AI, and let's not forget financials today trade very well. There's some people who don't pay attention to the markets and are like, as with a keen eye, the way they should. And they've been talking about how maybe financials lag. All I know is many people on Inner Circle bought Goldman Sachs over 100 points ago, just, I don't know, like maybe 16 weeks ago, Max. I know we bought Citigroup three, four points ago. They're trading pretty well. So, uh, and then we know what happened with biotech. So Apple is not the market the way it used to be. And God knows Google hasn't been for a long time and certainly isn't. And Tesla has been broken you know, for months now. Mm -hmm. All right, great. All right, David, I'll let you get back to your trading. Hope you have a great rest of your trading day for everyone else uh, who's joining us. Hope you also have a great rest of your trading day. If you want David's free ebook, the Hedge Fund Black Book, uh, to get some of his in more of his insights, you can go to t3live.com slash DP. Give us a free download of, of his ebook. Uh, I'll see you in a week, David. We'll be we'll be back in a week, a day before the Fed meeting. So thanks for joining me, everyone. Or for Bye. us, excuse me. Have a great day. <laughs> Bye, David. Bye-bye.